Who did their homework this week? Anybody? Oh, okay. What was it? Fourth. Fourth. There you go. May the fourth be with you. Uh, <laughs> I actually did a, a Pastor Mike Online podcast, and it was talking about that, that, the fourth dimension, and I named it, May the Fourth Be With You. And uh, it was from uh, Daniel 3.25. Um, and Daniel 3.25 is also one of those verses that I tell people to go to to tell whether or not they got the right Bible or not. Um, because in Daniel 3.25, in all the modern translations, and I found out in uh, the Swahili Bible, and this is, this is what uh, really... Uh, the, the church I preached at in uh, Kilimbombogo, uh, which means the, um, the mountain where the buffalo lives. Buffalo Mountain is what it is. What it is. It's a water, there's a water buffalo that lives up in this big hill that they've got there outside of town, and so the name of the town's Kilimbombogo. But anyway, when I was preaching out there, um, I was leading up to, we had like four or five days and every one of us preachers got about two times, two, two lectures during that day. And I was building people up to, uh, deal, to deal with this issue of, has the Bible been tampered with? Thank you, young man. Has the Bible been tampered with? And um, so it got down to it. I went and looked at what, how, how to say Son of God in Swahili. And it was uh, Moana wa Mungu. And when I looked at the Swahili Bibles that had been printed up, um, there had been a change in those Bibles because the Catholic Church got involved in it. And um, so they put in there Moana wa Miungu. And anytime you put that Y in a word, Mungu to Miungu, you pluralize it like putting an S on the end of our words, God versus gods. So the phrase read in Swahili, son of gods, son of the gods, in other words. And so um, I, I kind of used that little bit of Swahili to tell them I learned Swahili. And I said, and I deliberately said it wrong. I said, Mwana wa miyungu. And they said, no, 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 that's son of gods. And I'm going, oh, I got it wrong, huh? And they said, yeah. I said, turn to Daniel 3.25. And when they looked in their Swahili Bible and saw Moana wa Miungu, they, they got mad. They got mad because they knew that somebody had messed with their Bible. They knew it was wrong. They knew it couldn't be right. So anyway, it's in, it's in all the modern translations. They either translate it as son of, son of the gods uh, or one of the gods is how one of them translates it, I believe. But it's just blatantly wrong. Uh, and especially when you understand why the fourth one in there has to be Jesus Christ and not just a son of the gods. All right, now turn to Revelation 10. That was the dessert before, that was your coffee before breakfast. Revelation 10. All right. Revelation chapter 10. Uh, what was the homework? Does anybody remember? Yes. Cloud and clouds and cloudy and everything related to clouds. Does that ring a bell with anybody? Okay. Well, good. Hopefully you studied it out because we're going to do that this morning. So, again, my premise is that this mighty angel is none other than Jesus Christ. As we look into it, you will almost, you'll almost understand that it has to be Jesus Christ. It can't be 
somebody lesser than Jesus Christ, especially when we get to the rainbow part. And I'll explain that when we get there. So I saw another mighty angel come down from heaven. Now he's clothed with the cloud. Uh, we dealt with the issue of him being a mighty angel. He is. He is, he is greater than all the angels. He is the chief angel. He is the uh, high priest of the angelic order of Melchizedek. Uh, some say that Jesus is Melchizedek. Some say that he's not Melchizedek. Melchizedek is an angel who, is the, uh, who, who has the order of angels underneath him. But Christ then is the high priest after that order of Melchizedek. But he, basically he's in charge of all the angels. Uh, so we dealt with that coming down from heaven. Now we're going to look at the idea of him being clothed with a cloud and why that is so important. So let's go to Matthew 24 and stay in Matthew because there's a couple of places we're going to look there. Turn your Bible to Matthew chapter 24. All right, Matthew 24, verse, let's see, I have verse 30 here, but, and let's see here, I have Matthew 23 in my Bible, there we go. Uh, in verse 30, I want to back up and get some context here, look at verse 29, immediately after the tribulation of those days shall the sun be darkened. And the moon shall not give her light, and the stars shall fall from heaven, and the powers of the heavens shall be shaken. And then shall appear the sign of the Son of Man in heaven. So notice the word sign. That's a very important word. When the Bible tells you this is the sign of something, or this is the token of something, or this is, this is going to represent that. So when you see... Uh, like in the Old Testament, uh, the token that and we'll get to that when we get to the rainbow, but the token that God was going to keep his promise that he wasn't going to flood the earth with water ever again. That token was what? That he's going to put a bow in the cloud. And to this very day, we see rainbows. And every time it never fails. If you've noticed now, every time somebody says, oh, there's a rainbow. We all got to look at it because they fascinate us. Number one, they're pretty. They're beautiful. Number two, we as Christians know what they really mean. Other people who are lost, they don't necessarily understand it the way we do. And especially those who are, oh my goodness. Somebody sent me uh, a video of a woman preacher who their church celebrates LGBTQ. And so this lady preacher was equating Noah's Ark and that story with their flag. And she was saying that the whole point of Noah and the Ark was for God to, this is God here in all these colors. Do what? Mm-hmm. That's exactly right. That's why he destroyed it in the first place. Too much sin. Way too much sin. So, um, where was I? Verse, yeah. You shall, you shall, let's get back to verse 30. Then shall appear the sign of the Son of Man in heaven. So what is the sign? I think this is important because I think the world is going to be presented with the real Christ and another Christ, a fake one. Who can tell the difference between the real Jesus and the fake Jesus? Those who know the scripture, those who believe the scripture. Even if you are not good at memorizing Bible verses, which literally 
Memorizing Bible verses generally is just a matter of repetition. The more you read something, the more you become familiar with it. You remember, who remembers their phone number from the days when we had phones hanging on the wall? I do. I remember all of them, okay? From when I was a child and then when we got married. And yeah, it's, it's because it was familiar to you. You did it all the time. So Bible memorization is about as easy as that. But anyway, we get to the sign of something and pay attention to that. So he says, then shall appear the sign of the Son of Man in heaven. And then shall all the tribes of the earth mourn. And they shall see the Son of Man. Here's the sign coming in the clouds. That's the sign. It's coming in the clouds. Whereas, where is the Antichrist coming from? The sea, the bottomless pit. That's what John said in Revelation 13. I stood upon the sand of the sea and I saw a beast rise up out of the sea, having seven heads, ten horns. That's, a, that's literally what Daniel saw in Daniel chapter 7. He saw the, the four winds strive against the, uh, the sea. And out of the sea came forth four living creatures. The fourth one, did you study that one, Sister Helen? The okay, the fourth one was diverse from the other three. And that's something else that when you, if you, if you study, if you see a list of four things, I'll give you this. If you see a list of four things, one of those is going to be significantly different than the other three. Okay, so in the case of the four beasts in Daniel 7, you have, um, I think, a lion with eagle's wings, you have a leopard with four wings, and then you have a bear uh, in that. Those are the first three, but it, then it says, it specifically says, the fourth beast was diverse from the other three. So he's different. In the four Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, Matthew, Mark, and Luke are synoptic Gospels. They look the same. They have the same storyline, same outline, uh, same uh, stories and phrases that Jesus said. John is different than the other three. It's written differently. So anyway, you just take that and you run with it. All right, but anyway. So now we're going to see the sign of the Son of Man coming in the clouds of heaven with power and great glory. And he shall send his angels. Now, when that happens, when they see the Son of Man coming in the clouds, he shall send his angels with a great sound of a trumpet. They shall gather together his elect from the four winds, from one end of heaven to the other. So, follow this progression. We have the tribulation of those days. Bible doesn't say that that's seven years, doesn't even say it's three and a half years. But we have a period of days that the Bible refers to as a tribulation of those days. That's the exact phrase. After that, the sign of the Son of Man. So that's him coming in the clouds of heaven with power and great glory. And when he does, he's going to send his angels with a great sound of a trumpet. So when we take this and we go to places like, I don't know if I have it in my notes. I might have. But go to 1 Thessalonians 4. And I'll leave Matthew 24 up on the screen for you. 1 Thessalonians 4. Verse 16 and 17. For the Lord himself shall descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of the archangel, and then with the trump of God. That's Matthew 24, 31. He shall send his angels with the great sound of a trumpet. And then verse, uh, and the dead in Christ shall rise first. Verse 17. Then we which are alive and remain shall be caught up 
together with them in the what? Clouds. To meet the Lord in the air. And so shall we ever be with the Lord. So here's Christ descending from heaven in the clouds. We're going to meet the dead in Christ who have risen first. We're going to meet them in the clouds. And we'll be with Christ who is there waiting for us in the clouds. And so shall we ever be with the Lord. Therefore, comfort one another with these words. And I try as much as possible to not get in debates or arguments or who's right and who's wrong when it comes to the rapture. Because we're not supposed to. We're not supposed to argue about these words. We're supposed to comfort one another with these words. Bottom line is, no matter what you believe, Jesus is coming for you. He's coming for you. He loves you. He cares for you. He has your name written down, and he's coming for you. Yes, Gary? I'm trying to figure out, I'm just sitting trying to figure out, why is it, and I know the Bible says it, but why is it that the dead in Christ rise first? Is it because they don't have the soul in them? I mean, there may not be an answer to that question. But, is, I mean, we still have, if we're alive, we still have the soul. Yeah. I that the soul goes to heaven when he dies. Now, I don't have a perfect answer for that. In other words, I can't quote two verses of scripture. What I have is they died first, having not seen the promises. Those who are alive on that day will not die. And for some reason last night, I don't know why, I was thinking about my death how it would be I don't know if you've ever done that I don't know if you've ever considered how you're going to die but anything short of me going to sleep one night and waking up in heaven I don't think I'm going to like it too much because death is it in order to cause the body to stop functioning some form of massive pain and torture and terrible, terrible beatings and bleeding and everything else, like in a car accident or you've fallen off the, your house or whatever. Anything that brings death to us, we're both going to hurt tremendously or we're going to fear it as it's happening to us, okay? Um, I feared death when I was being electrocuted. The proof of that was what my son heard. What'd you hear, Matthew? Screaming, screaming, louder than I've ever screamed in my life, because I didn't want to go through that again. I, didn't, I wasn't going to crawl out of there because I didn't know what I'd touched. And I just laid there and screamed and cried. So death is something that we know is going to be painful or fearful to us. So those who are simply translated into heaven without dying, they get to bypass all that. They have no fear, no pain, no sorrow, nothing. But those who've already died, some of them have suffered greatly. I've seen, we've had people in this church died of cancer. It's a slow, painful death. It takes a while. Or died of Alzheimer's. My grandmother died of Alzheimer's. And it's a slow death. It's a, it's a horrible death. And so I think that God is giving them favor by causing them to rise first, these would be people, uh, well, I won't say that because it's not totally true. But anyway, my, my personal opinion is, is that because they died first, they get to go first. Okay? That was a long way of asking me what time it is, and I'll tell you how they built this watch, all right? Anyway. But the, the thing here is, they shall see the Son of Man coming in the clouds of heaven with power and great glory. 
And he shall send his angels with a great sound of a trumpet, and they shall gather together his elect from the four winds, from one end of heaven to the other. And when you match that with uh, Revelation 10, I won't, I won't go into it, but after we get the description of this angel and the, uh, the angel roaring like a lion roars and the seven thunders utter their voices, and then uh, the angel says there should be time no longer, but in the days of the voice of the seventh angel, when he shall begin to sound, the mystery of God should be finished. And so the mystery of God has a lot to do with the salvation of Israel and the redeeming, the resurrection, the rapture of God's saints. Behold, I show you a mystery, and so on. All right? Now, uh, Matthew 26. Turn there. My mouth is like cotton again today. I think it's a medication I take. Matthew 26. Verse... Let's see here. Oh, yeah. Verse, look at verse 61. Or 59. Now the chief priests and elders and all the council sought false witness against Jesus to put him to death. But found none. Yea, though many false witnesses came, yet found they none. At the last came two false witnesses. And said, this fellow said, I am able to destroy the temple of God and to build it in three days. Now, yes, Jesus did say that. But what was he referring to? Temple of his body. And you have to ask the question, which would be easier to do? Build a temple out of stone in three days or build an entire human body from scratch in three days? Which would be easier to do? For Christ... They're both the same. Amen? He can just do it, and it's done. So, verse 62, And the high priest arose and said unto him, Answerest thou nothing? What is it which these witness against thee? But Jesus held his peace. You know, sometimes that's the best way to give an answer. So hold your peace. And that way, nobody can accuse you or misinterpret or twist something you said because you didn't say anything and the uh, Jesus held his peace and the high priest answered and said unto him I adjure thee by the living God that thou tellest whether thou be the Christ the Son of God now verse 64 which I have on the screen Jesus saith unto him thou hast said nevertheless I say unto you hereafter shall you see the Son of Man sitting in the right hand of power and coming in the clouds of heaven. So that's the second witness. Christ is coming in the clouds of heaven. Turn to Acts chapter 1. Good old Acts. Some of the words here, obviously, if you have a red letter edition Bible, you'll notice in Acts chapter 1, we have Jesus speaking. And so, in, um, oh, let's see here, verse 6, when they therefore were come together, they asked of him, saying, Lord, what would what, what thou at this time restore again the kingdom to Israel? And he said unto them, it is not for you to know the times or the seasons which the Father hath put in his own power, but... You shall receive power after that the Holy Ghost has come upon you and you shall be witnesses unto me both in Jerusalem and in all Judea and in Samaria and unto the uttermost part of the earth. And when he had spoken these things while they beheld, he was taken up and a cloud received him out of their sight. And while they looked steadfastly toward heaven as he went up, and this is important now, while they looked steadfastly toward heaven as he went up, behold, two men stood by them in white apparel which also said, ye men of Galilee. Now, who are these men that say this? Who are these men? Uh, the men that say to the apostles. Angels. They're angels. 
While they looked steadfastly toward heaven as he went up, behold, two men stood by them in white apparel, which also said, Ye men of Galilee, why stand ye gazing up into heaven? This same Jesus, which is taken up from you into heaven, shall so come in like manner as ye have seen him go into heaven. So we go back to verse 9. When they had spoken these things, behold, while they beheld, he was taken up and a cloud received him out of their sight. So he went up in a cloud and the two angels in white apparel are telling them, why stand you gazing? Because when he comes, he's coming again in like manner. He's going to descend down. He's going to be covered with a cloud. The cloud's going to bring him down, is what they're saying. So now we still have associated consistently with the appearing of Jesus in the air. He's coming with clouds. He's coming with clouds. In this case, a cloud lifted him up and the cloud is going to bring him back down. So come in like manner. Revelation 1, turn there. Excuse me? The upper room, that's uh, Acts chapter 2. Revelation chapter 1, verse 7. This is John speaking. Spreckens it, John. And he says, Behold, he cometh with clouds, and every eye shall see him, and they also which pierced him, and all kindreds of the earth shall wail because of him, even so, amen. So I believe what this teaches and, and the other verses, that when Christ appears in the clouds, everybody in the world is going to look up and they're going to see him there. Now, believe it or not, this is one of the verses that the people who believe in a flat earth say is proof that the earth is flat. Because Jesus appears in the clouds in the air, the only way for everybody to see him is if the earth is flat. Do what? Sure it is. Sure it is. They, they're so ridiculous in their belief. Okay? Uh, but i am be honest with you. I have found that even when you try to reason with people that, are, that have already eaten the apple of flat earth, there's no way to unbite that apple. Okay? <laughs> Unless God does it. Because I've had people that I've tried every reasonable thing in the world to get them to understand and they won't they won't budge and that's and I I went to God with this it really bothered me and I said God how is it that these people just believe this all of a sudden and you can't change them and Ezekiel 14 came to mind God said they they, they believe it in their heart and they have a stumbling block in their heart which allows them to believe things that are not true and I thought, oh my goodness. Boy, it's possible that any of us could fall into some sort of lunacy and believe some sort of weird, crazy, wrong, far out doctrines. Um, unless, unless we have God cast down all of these imaginations and all these idols and get rid of them. Now, that's the only remedy for that. So Revelation, uh, that was Revelation 1, Revelation uh, 14. Turn there, and I looked, and behold, a white cloud. Here's another one. In this, in this instance, uh, God has slipped in an advertisement for toilet paper. Pumps. 
Not really. Not really. That was a joke. Uh, Revelation 14, 14. I looked and behold a white cloud. And upon the cloud one sat like unto the Son of Man. Notice they capitalized this. They knew it was deity. They knew it was Christ. Having on his head a golden crown. And in his hand a sharp sickle. And another angel came out of the temple, crying with a loud voice to him that sat on the cloud, Thrust in thy sickle and reap, for the time is come for thee to reap, for the harvest of the earth is ripe. And he that sat on the cloud thrust in his sickle on the earth, and the earth was reaped. Now, I don't have this in my notes, so you'll have to turn in your Bible. Turn, turn to Matthew 13. I'm going to tell you what I kind of think on this. Matthew chapter 13. And I could be wrong. And praise the Lord, I hope that I am on some things. I let God be true and every man a liar. I'm not capable of saying everything correctly. I'm not. And uh, I wouldn't want that. I wouldn't want to take the glory away from God. What God says is always true. We can always count on it. What I say or somebody else says, uh, you need to take it with a grain of salt and two verses of scripture. Because you need to be able to prove that which is good. Hold fast that which is good. Prove all things. So now in Matthew chapter 13, we have the parable of the, uh, the sower uh, and the seed. Uh, no, where it's, yeah, the wheat and the tares. That's what I'm thinking of. Matthew 24, Matthew 13, 24. Another parable put he forth unto them, saying, The kingdom of heaven is likened unto a man which sowed good seed in his field. But while men slept, his enemy came and sowed tares among the wheat and went his way. So now I want you to think of Revelation 14 now. Here's, here is what looks like Christ. He's, he's on a cloud and he is the son of man. And he has a golden crown on his head and he has a very sharp sickle in his hand and um, and he is now reaping the earth because it's time of harvest and so um, verse 25 while men slept his enemy uh, came and sowed tares among the wheat and went his way and when the blade was sprung up and he brought and brought forth fruit then appeared the tares also so the servants of the householder came and said unto him, Sir, didst not thou sow good seed in thy field? From whence then hath it tares? And he said unto them, An enemy hath done this. The servants said unto him, Wilt thou then that we go and gather them up? But he said, Nay, lest while ye gather up the tares, ye root up also the wheat with them. Let both grow together until the harvest. And in the time of harvest, I will say to the reapers, Gather ye together first the tares, bind them in bundles, and burn them, but gather the wheat into my barn. And so the interpretation of this is over in verse uh, 37. He that sowed the good seed is the son of man. The field is the world. The good seed are the children of the kingdom. But the tares are the children of the wicked one. The enemy that sowed them is the devil. And the harvest is the end of the world. And the reapers are the angels. As therefore the, the tares are gathered and burned in the fire. So shall it be in the end of this world. So basically what you are seeing here in Revelation 14 is the harvest. And remember, I've showed this picture where you have wheat and tares and they both, while they're both green, it's very difficult to discern which is which. And that is sort of like the Bible issue or any other issue that we're dealing with as far as what's right and what's wrong doctrine. But wait until the fruit time. Wait until the time of harvest because everything changes at harvest time. Green apples turn red. Um, tomatoes go from green to red. Um, the wheat goes from green to yellow like the sun. Tares go from green to being black like darkness. And uh, those are the dangerous ones. And, and so when the harvesters went out, to harvest those crops, they could very easily then tell what was a tear and what was a what was wheat. And while you and I may not be able to discern right now who really is saved and who isn't saved, I promise you 
that when it's time for everybody's transformation, it's going to be known who is and who isn't. And some people are going to be surprised. Can I hear God's people say amen? amen. Let it not be you that is surprised. Father, we ask your blessings upon your word today. Thank you, God, for your goodness. And Father, I pray, dear God, that you would help us along in this day. Lord, Father, there may be issues, there may be situations in people's lives, Father, that just need a touch from you. They need the word of God. They need healing. They need help. I pray, dear God, that you would be that help. Thank you, Lord, for this word we pray in Jesus' name. And all of God's people said, Amen. Amen.